Okay, and then uh, we are now going to witness an interview between Mrs. Uh, Huda Smithhuizen Abifares and Mr. Dingeman de Kelman. Um, I'm proud to present them because yesterday we were on a talk and I tried to pinpoint uh, where uh, Mrs. Smithhuizen Abifares, the first part of her last name is very Dutch and the second is uh, Arabic. And I was saying, where do you live and where were you born and where did you study? Well, it was New York and Beirut and Amsterdam. And at one point she said, locality is not a theme for me and in this society. And I thought, whoa, that's heavy. So please come to stage because she tries to bridge different cultures and different ideas uh, around this world. And I have to think longer because I, I think I don't agree, but I do. I am fascinated <laughs> by what you said. Um, please sit down. Please sit okay. down. And this is Mr. Dingeman Kelman, and he is now. He, he worked at Philips Premzela uh, Studio Beke. One? He's now the boss of uh, uh, Artes uh, uh, Academy Art and Design. Um, go ahead, Mr. Kelman. <laughs> oh yeah. He asked the questions and she is being questions. Well, that, that, uh, we'll, we'll see. It's more like a conversation, uh, I guess. Thanks, Lucas, <laughs> for your kind introduction. Um, we, we just agreed that uh, we wouldn't tell that we met 25 years ago <laughs> at the studio of Anton Beek in uh, Amsterdam. And I'm only telling it because in the meantime you've you've become the driving force behind the CAT Foundation. Yeah. And the CAT, CAT Foundation today is, uh, is listed by, uh, by the Rolling Stone, uh, a rock magazine, as one of the main influences on design in the next decade. Yeah. It's a so very you're, you're world famous now, huh? Yeah. Hard to believe, right? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a quite a responsibility. Actually, I only found out about the listing when you sent me an email saying, and now we're going to start by this. And I thought, I had no idea what you're talking about. You didn't know it? No, I didn't know it, which was a really nice surprise. It was funny. Um, so I went online, and then I read the text. I was like, oh, okay, great. Um, now what do I do if I'm the most, uh, if I have an influence on the future? I think it's, um, it, it was sort of like nice for about five minutes and kind of like sweating after that thing. Oh God. Um, but on the other hand, I think, yeah, every designer actually has an influence on the future. Yeah, yeah, but, um, but, but, but we, we're talking about you and your okay. work. Uh, do you have any idea why they selected you? Um, I think I read their statement. I think they were looking for um, a diverse type of people working outside uh -huh. the context of what designers normally do. Mm -hmm. And I think that I have, uh, f since I've started this foundation, I have actually stopped designing in the, natu in the sort of traditional way. I'm a graphic designer, a book designer, but I actually now design more with, in collaboration with other people. And actually, they do the design, which is a very strange sort of relationship. It's, um, the, it's the way of working, especially. It's the way of working, I think, yeah. and it's also the okay, fact so, they, they so didn't select me personally, they selected the Hutt Foundation, which yeah, I think yeah. is, is telling that... Okay, okay, tell us about the difference. Um, the difference is... What's, what's the Hutt Foundation? What's the Hutt Foundation? The Hutt Foundation is um, a platform for designers from the Middle East. Yeah. Um, it started with the idea that we need to work on new developments for Arabic typography, which was lagging behind. And yeah. then it's kind of broadened why, into... Why, why did you feel the need to work on Ar Arabic typography? Um, what was going on? Nothing. That nothing. Was, that okay. was the reason. Okay. Good. Um, or very little. Yeah. Uh, but in my opinion, nothing and not enough and not the right way. And yeah. I well, had... What was wrong? Um, I, when, I, when I first... I studied outside of, of, yeah. of the Middle East, and when I went back to work, because I thought I had to kind of contribute back to my culture, um, I discovered that actually there were no design, I mean, typography is a kind of basic design tool, and it yeah. was, what was available was very old-fashioned scripts yeah. that just, you couldn't really make contemporary design with. They were yeah. not flexible, they were... And did, um, did, 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 did you look at it as a basic design tool, or as a basic tool for culture or even democracy? Um, what, what, what point of view did you take? 
Well, in the beginning, it was really, let's make it, let's make diversity, let's create more diversity that reflects what was happening in the Middle East. There was more designers, young designers, that, that had a lot more talent that was not reflected in the way their script is supposed to serve them. And then it became, then it, it became, you know, you start something and then you don't know how people will react to your, to your work. And the response that we got from just launching this website and um, having so many members and people saying, oh, thank you for making this. And now we have something we can actually meet each other, which is also another thing that is a big myth about the Middle East is that it's, it's different countries that have a lot in common, but they are very different as well. And they, their borders are close to each other. Yeah. And it's easier for somebody from Egypt to come to Holland than to go to Beirut, for example. Um, so these kind of borders had to, was also in the way people designed, there was no connection. So I felt that if we, if we start to work with a script and it has so much meaning for so many people, then it's a powerful tool. It's very simple. You can use it for politics and democracy, and, yeah. but you can also use it to make nice books and, um, I don't know, heavy metal posters. Yeah. I mean, it's... It's, it's in a way neutral, but yeah. at the same time it's very political because it touches everybody's... Yeah. And they can use it in different ways, so it, they can easily appropriate it. But you're... So that, that's, that's what's happening in the Middle East, huh? so... Uh, uh, crossing borders, yeah. bringing people together uh, by means of typography, by means of cal calligraphy. Yeah. But on the other hand, you're also looking upon the differences between, let's say, the Middle East, Northern Africa, and Europe. Yeah, um, I Why? think because I think the history of the Arabic typography has yeah. always been produced in the West because of the connection of type and man, you know, production of typography okay. and yeah. machines. The machines are always done here. They still are. You know, we all walk around with, yeah. with American computers. Um, so there has to be a connection. Um, what, what happened in the past is that the things were produced specifically in the sort of lowest common denominator, that they would be accepted, and therefore you can sell the machine. It was very kind of pragmatic, commercially based. And there's nothing wrong with that. But once, once the tools are in the hands of people and they can actually make their own typefaces, nothing was happening. And that was a bit um, the feeling that maybe there is no skill for okay. the production of, of typography in the Middle East. And, and that was the case. There were no schooling for it. No, People didn't know how to do it. They can draw it, but they can't really make it into a product, into yeah. a tool. So then bringing people that can make and people that know how it should be made in, in the, on the aesthetic level was very important. And that's what the idea of Khat came from, the Khat Foundation. Okay. To bring the two groups to work together and collaborate where everyone brings their own skill and their own history and to see what happens when they come together. And one of the projects that, that, that came out of it uh, and that, that, that became rather successful and famous was El Hema, huh? a project the Cut yeah. Foundation did with uh, Mediamatic, yeah. I uh, believe. Uh, what kind of a project was it? Where did it start? It started with the very basic thing of saying, well, we have um, lots of um, design problems in the Middle East. Um, one of the things that I was personally involved, I mean, interested in was making books because I'm a book designer. So then I realized there are no fonts that can make good books. So we started with this premise of making typography, making book typography, but then contemporary, so not copying what has been designed for centuries. Um, and then my idea was to invite Dutch designers that have a, um, that are, have very good skills and non-Dutch designers, which I'm not going to name in this uh, talk, and to um, look at their fonts or some of their fonts and create something that is possible um, to use also for the Arabic script. So. So then I invited Arab designers as well to work yeah. with them. And what we developed basically is textbook, um, well, text fonts. Yeah. But that was the premise. That was, that was what we wanted, was set out to do, but that didn't necessarily, you know, then the market decides what goes for a book and what doesn't. You yeah. know, so, okay. 
Um, then when we finished the project, we, I mean, the project was generously fun, funded by the Fondsbeck ABV in Holland, so it was also a nice, you know, surprise. <laughs> um, so we had to make a presentation here, and we looked for places, and we thought about how do you exhibit this? How can you exhibit to a larger public? Because I think it's very meaningful. I mean, the, bringing designers to work together on something so basic and so important and symbolic is very meaningful. But if you want to present it, you can't just you know, blow up letters yeah. on a wall. You so can, but only some people would be interested. So how do we make it yeah. um, a very public yeah. event? And so we brainstormed and we thought, you know, let's you know, collaborating with Mediamatic on how can we do this. And then one day we thought, well, it would be fantastic if we can create an exhibition that people can walk in and walk out with it. You know, take it home, think about it. Um, what would be the best thing to do? Let's make a t-shirt. It was in the summer. People will wear t-shirts with any slogan. And, and then, you know, then aside from t-shirt, to then became El Hema. And, okay. and then it took a life of its own. Yeah, yeah. Was, was, uh, um, I've, I've, I've personally uh, seen El Hema as a political project. Yeah. Or was it just a fun project? Um, no, I think it was a political project, yeah. yeah. I think it's, but it's also, um, but it was light, it was not about, it was, you know, it, it was it just was a year or two years after the uh, Theo van Gogh was, uh, was killed in Amsterdam, I think. Oh, and, yeah. and, and people was very, very, very... There was already starting uh, to be a friction and this yeah, kind of image People were very of, cynical yeah. about... Uh, um, about the capabilities yeah. to bridge uh, cultural gaps, yeah. and then all of a sudden there was El Hema, which was kind of a fun project yeah. that celebrated the differences. Yeah, and I think I think that was the success of it. I mean, the political environment around what was happening. If it, maybe if it had happened tw ten years ago, it would have had a completely yeah. or less effect. Nobody knows. But it's also it. I think it was important to have to create a project where you can talk about the similarities and the differences. In a, in a sort of uh, secular, yeah. neutral, and fun way. Yeah. Because then people can think, oh yeah, it's not, you know, it's interesting. And then, and then you can also, in a way, it becomes a bit exotic as well, because it's nice to wear a t-shirt that you can't read. And, and could, could you have developed a similar project in the Middle East? Um, did if you, you, did I you mean, try it? I, I've presented actually what happened with El Hema in yeah, the Middle East, yeah, and no, they said, no. we want the yeah. shop here. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. I said, it's not a shop, but uh, <laughs> I think, I think if you did it in the Middle East, then you would have had to pick on something very political, and maybe it would have been more scary, actually, yeah. because here you can talk about politics without, you know, losing your head, and there, it's, and, and depends on where you are in the Middle East as well. So some places you can be more liberal, and you can, you know, state your opinion very clearly. In other places, it's, it, you know, you start a war by doing that. So. so. We, we all know that, that uh, at this very moment there's a lot going on in the Middle East. Um, people are fighting for freedom, people yeah. are fighting for democracy, yeah. also freedom of press, uh, there's a lot of illiteracy still yeah. around. What's your view upon those developments? Um. Broad question, but... It's a very broad question. I'm trying to think how to answer it. Um, I, I think any kind of shaking up the old system is always good, whether the system was good or not. It's, yeah. it's always good to have change. Um, I think as a designer and someone who's involved in, in, in yeah. design exhibitions and, and cultural thing, I think the idea of questioning is, of course, very healthy and very much needed. I, mean, I, used, I taught for 12 years in the Middle East, off and on, in Beirut and then in Dubai. And I always was shocked when I had students in my class that always asked permission to do things. Like, can we do this? And I say, yeah, but you're the designer. You say, we have to do this. You have to take on the other role and not ask permission. And I think when I see these kind of insurrections, I think, okay, now they get the point. They have to do things. They cannot ask permission, because if you ask permission, you might get a yes or no. And so don't ask, just do what you want to do. And, and that's what um, you try to teach them. That's what I try to teach them. And I think that's also the premise, I mean, that's also the, the goal of the foundation is to allow these conversations to happen, to allow projects that don't normally, are not possible to do outside of, uh, either in, in, in certain societies or in a sort of commercial. And, uh, and, and does the Cut Foundation try to play a role in those, those uh, changes that are going on? Is, I think there, is there a role for designers, for typographers? 
Absolutely. I think a lot of the work that we do sometimes gets criticism from very conservative people. I always think that. Because they think you are, I mean, we had an exhibition in, in Doha as an example, and the Minister of Culture was visiting this exhibition. It was a calligraphy biennale. And they gave me one space to say contemporary stuff. And he came in, he walked around, he looked at the, all these posters, he's like, your, your work is dangerous. I was like, wow, that's nice. <laughs> I never thought of myself as dangerous. <laughs> and I said, why? He said, you're destroying the Arabic script. Which is very interesting, because, of course, then his, his, his young attaché was next to him, kept yeah. explaining to him, like, no, this is really good. This is, like, yeah. new stuff, blah, blah, blah. And to me, that's... That's exactly what Khat is doing, is giving voice to people that, young designers, that don't want to be told what is right or wrong. It's up to them. I don't, I don't take position. But I don't think the old is bad. Or no, but on the other hand, it also mirrors the situation, for instance, in the Netherlands, where, uh, uh, let's say, political mainstream parties are very concerned about our own culture. Yeah. I mean, some of our politicians might have said the same. Possibly, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think conservatism is all over the world, and wherever you can just make conservative people so just So on, on both sides, there's good. this, there's this uh, politicians are scared to lose their identity and their culture. Yeah, but it's also, in my opinion, I think you only lose your culture if you put it in a, in, if you put it in a, in a coffin, if you, if you mummify it, you know, and put it in a museum, yeah. then you lose it, because it dies. And, and any culture has to keep on changing and has to evolve. And it doesn't mean you have to ignore everything that's happened before, because of course that would be something no. silly. Um, but you know, you have to have the ability to say it's my culture, and I want to do whatever I want to do with it. I mean, it's it's people always ask you like, where 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 do you come from? At least me, where do you come from? What's your identity? And I think, well, everywhere I've lived, I think I've carried something from that. That's all my identity. So I am American, French, Dutch. Yeah. Um, and that's 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 why you said <laughs> said to Lucas that <laughs> yeah. locality doesn't matter um, it matters in if you if you don't confine yourself to it it matters it matters to me that that the Hutt foundation is actually talking about you know um, loosening up the definitions and kind of loosen getting rid of borders getting rid of borders in our heads obviously you cannot change uh, countries but you know the whole Middle East borders I mean the physical borders of these countries are completely European made so they're fake. Yeah. Every border, every nationality is kind of fake. You have to, in, in, if you really put it in that definition. And so to every person it means something else. You know? yeah, but and in design, I think we, 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 we are trained to push borders. So I think as designers we can be very good to in kind of help politicians relax. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Some no, that, that, that sounds really promising. Um, promising. <laughs> playing the devil's advocate. Yeah. One could also argue that uh, in, in, the, in the current political climate, uh, the differences in typography, yeah, so the, the mm. difference between, uh, let's say, Arabic calligraphy and, and Western type is in a way doomed to stigmatize also the cultural differences. Because so many people are so scared of losing their identity. Yeah, but... And ending up in chaos, in a way. Yeah, but I think, I mean, in, also in Western typography, you have very conservative uh, designers and very conservative directions and less. And I don't think that um, it's wrong to compare Arabic calligraphy and Western typography, you have to talk about typography and not compare calligraphy, because calligraphy is sort of not, I mean, it's not, produ it's not produced, it's, it's, it's handmade, it's yeah. a different kind of field. Um, there is Arabic typography, and yeah. that is kind of, um, somebody called it writing, it's, it's like a system, a system of letters. It's not really, um, once you put it into production, it has, it has a different life and it's used differently, whereas if you're a calligrapher, you make something and that's it. That's, that's okay. the one and only thing. Um, I think losing your identity is something that as a designer you have to decide what your identity is. It should be more personal and not so much like you're, you're labeled as Dutch, so every Dutch person in this room is exactly the same. I find that very hard to believe. So, and I would say the same about every any other nationality. So you can decide, you can say, well, we all speak Dutch, that's, therefore we're Dutch, but then there's lots of non-Dutch people that speak Dutch. 
So are they Dutch? Okay. I understand um, what you say. <laughs> so, so with design, I think it's the same. I think if, if you try to create um, similarities or at least bring some, some similarities together and emphasize the differences, then you create what you were talking about of bringing the cultures together and saying, well, we have some things in common. We can talk to each other, but we're not the same. And that's okay, too. You know, we don't have to yes. be the same. Yeah. Um, what... what I found for my my projects and the criticism I get for it sometimes the harshest criticism come from Western designers that say, "But you're ruining your own script," and it's very strange. Like they're more Catholic than got, the Pope. Yeah, but. they've got a romantic view on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And so I think sometimes it's it's hard to understand where everyone comes from and yeah. at, at some point in your life you have to decide. I believe that we that every designer should decide for themselves what things they should keep and what things they should throw out of their culture. Okay. Um. Very clear. <laughs> um, so now you're, you, uh, the, the, you, there, there's this heavy burden of making an impact on design in the next decade. So uh, you'll be invited. Uh, to talk about it. It's 2022. <laughs> okay. So okay. There's Huda again. And then I can say, well, did it, did it work? <laughs> What would you, what would you personally would have liked to, to have achieved by then? Do you do you have an idea of? Um, I I. I if I, everything goes right, if we if all support you, then what will happen? What can we make happen? Get rid of borders. <laughs> That's that's the, the that's the main thing, and then the the borders. But I, I think I mean I think I don't know. I I I'm sorry, but I never really think in in slices of time that way. I always feel like, as a designer, you have to be like a sponge. You know, I yeah. know that I want to work on Arabic typography and on typography in yeah. general because I think it's a very powerful tool, and I find it interesting personally. Yeah. And I'm not the only one, so there's lots of people that yeah. are willing to work with me on it. And the, but as a designer, I feel like you have to be a sponge, you know, I, I don't know in 10 years where I'm yeah, going to be, but I want to be working on this, and I don't know how it will, you no. know, change. It, could one also say you take a viral approach to change? I like that, yeah. I mean, I think, it, for example, the first project that we did, it, it was... It was it culminated in El Hema, but it also was a book that had uh, free fonts on it, or sort of fonts that went with the book, and people used them all over the world, and it was great because all of a sudden you you um, walk into the ministry of yeah. I don't know what, and there's the typeface you've created yeah. used, and it's official yeah. and it's, it's kind of, so it's accepted. It's everybody uses it. Maybe they don't know where it comes from. It's kind from. of cultural guerrilla that you're. Yeah, and that you're I, I leading. think, is, 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 and is I that, think that is that is this is the yeah. advantage of design. I think one of the speakers was saying, you know, what's what's great about design. I think the power of design is that it can be very humble. Nobody is going to say, well, you know, I have, you know, they don't they don't like your couch, no. they don't buy it. No. But if they buy it, it's in their house. They live with it. You know, if they buy your toothbrush, you're in their mouth. Yeah. It's so it has a, it has a, a power that is for everybody to use. It's kind of by nature democratic. Um, and, but at the same time, it's humble. You know, it's, you don't have to say, "Well, I'm going to be, you know, conquer the world," but you probably do without yeah. intending to even. I really like the humbleness, and I, 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 I like <laughs> the, the approach you've taken, and 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 really, uh, you've achieved such a lot. In. But I have to say again, I I don't think that it's. I think sometimes it's by listening to what is around you and being sensitive to it, you can create a lot of things. And and the, the I think the success of the Khat Foundation is not me. It's no, it's no, no. everybody that's that decided to join. And but someone has to take form. the first step. That's 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 always. That's the, always that's, that's always that's the insane always the one. The so yeah. thank you very much for having <laughs> taken that step. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dingman Kalman and Huda Smithaja Abi Fares. We are going to have a lunch break right now, one hour lunch break. And please, during the lunch break, don't forget to add to the exhibition by uh, filling in the center.